Before we start, I will go through some good practices that will help us all have a smooth online experience. Please make sure your microphone is muted at all times. Secondly, please disable your camera and keep it off throughout the whole webinar. In third place, if during the discussion you have any questions, we will be collecting all these questions through the chat function. You can find it at the right side of your screen. Use a private chat to send your questions to user BIST. I will be compiling the questions and share them with our speakers during the Q&A. Before presenting today's session, I would like to take this opportunity to put this webinar in context and introduce the framework that BIST together with the seven BIS centers are putting together in the area of career development. We are developing a series of actions for our researchers in order to support professional progression beyond academia. BIST is highly committed to promoting that the scientific talent that is being developed at the BIS centers is transferred and has an impact by adding value to other sectors, such as industry, public policy, and education. For that, BIS will be organizing a series of webinars to share the experience of researchers who have continued with their professional paths in different roles and sectors and share useful and necessary information on how to approach these turns in careers. We are, of course, open to ideas and suggestions of topics which satisfy your interests, so feel free to reach out to us at any time with your comments. With that, we can go ahead and get started. This webinar today offers us the chance to learn about scientific careers in the area of consulting and public policy. Three experts will share their own career paths and give their insights on the whole spectrum of roles that are offered in that specific branch of consulting. I'm happy to introduce Dr. Sonia Vega, who's a biomedical research analysis, analyst and consultant at Ceres Academic, Dr. Juan Casales, who's partner at Estrategia Momentum Co. and executive consultant at BRN Foundation, and Dr. Ana Valdivia, who's data scientist at Trilateral Research. With that brief introduction, I welcome Dr. Juan Casals. So please take the floor. Hello. Uh, thank you, Donna. Uh, do you hear me correctly? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. So, well, thank you everyone for for your attendance at the seminar. Uh, well, I, I would like to, to start with a question. Uh, what has in common strategic planning and with oligonucleotide synthesis? No? And I guess that really nothing, except that it represents uh, my own professional evolution uh, for the last uh, 15 years. No? Uh, I did the PhD in organic chemistry in 2005. I finished it. Uh, so it was 15 years ago. And now I work as a consultant uh, in a small consultancy firm in which I am also one of the partners. So, well, uh, when I did my degree or even my master or my PhD, I never thought about uh, working as a consultant in the future. Actually, I, I didn't know even that the consultancy sector even exists. No? So, because I, I was focused on an academic uh, career and on doing research and working as a researcher. But then uh, life is like that, no? full of surprises. And I think you have to take opportunities that, that are given to you and, and to, well, to really face challenges, no? which I have to admit that I love challenges. So first of all, I would like to, to explain you a little bit about uh, consultancy. Um, what's consultancy? What means uh, being a consultant? What kind of, of tasks uh, you perform? And then I will, I will review a little bit my, my, my career evolution from, from the PhD from uh, since uh, I, until where I am now. And well, at the end, uh, explaining a little bit the, the skills that I think that have helped me working as a consultant. Uh, and, and so the, the skills that I, I, I took from my PhD and that uh, they are really useful um, 
uh, in, in all the sectors. No? So first of all, uh, for me, um, so consultancy consists basically on helping clients uh, by satisfying their unmet needs. I mean, there is an organization that have a, a need and, and they need uh, someone to help them um, to, to solve it, no? So there are a, a wide variety of consultancy firms. Uh, there are maybe the most typical ones or one of the most renowned ones are the technological uh, consultancy firms that they implement technological uh, solutions. Then there are also law consultants no? that they give you advice on on the on the laws and how to how to manage uh, the things uh, within the, the law framework then there are environmental consultants see uh, which they are focused on environmental issues uh, business consultancies that they help businesses to improve their uh, their gains no their, their incomes and finally, well, there are, well, there are a lot of, of consultancy firms, but there are sectorial uh, consultancy firms. So uh, con firms uh, focused on mobility, that they have a lot of, of knowledge and expertise on grant management, for example, and well, other kind of sectors. In my case, I work in a small company. We are eight people right now, and we work we are uh, focused on public sector consultancy and uh, with uh, topics related to strategic planning and, and organizational improvement. What does it mean? <laughs> no? uh, it means that we, we help uh, clients uh, that are mainly uh, public administration institutions or also uh, non-profit organizations who so we work in the in this sector uh, in defining their future strategies and in helping them to implement these strategies and to monitoring uh, that these strategies uh, are accomplished in a way. Uh, Apart from that, we do a lot of things, other things that clients just uh, need and they know you and they trust you and then they ask you to do it. Eh? But, but mainly our, our main focus would be like that, eh? strategic planning and organization, organizational improvements. Consultancy work is structured in projects. So every collaboration is called a project and it consists in, in different tasks to be done within a specific period of time uh, in order to obtain a predefined output in a way. No? So there is the starting situation where the client has, um, has a, a willingness to, to do something or, or the need to do something and they contract the consultancy firm and then the consultancy firm um, uh, with uh, with a team, no, uh, perform all uh, different tasks in order to to accomplish this this goal or this output that that it's valuable for the client. So you have to give value to the client. Um, projects vary on, on size and complexity, one from each other. So some ones can require big teams and, and a lot of months, and another ones can be done by only one person in several days. So, uh, so there are all kind of projects. And well, uh, in in our case, we the most typical projects we work on are projects which takes between three and six months and and they are like that no the, uh, so how to face the elaboration of a strategic plan how to identify uh, strategic issues key issues for the future how to elaborate uh, action plans uh, in order the institutions to evolve in the future and and well, and, and meet the, the vision that they they would like to to reach in the following years. No? 
and that's more or less the the job uh, I do. We are a multidisciplinary team. I am a chemist, which is uh, quite strange in this sector not to have a chemist uh, because there's nothing to do about chemistry and there's nothing to do about science even no, in most of the projects. Uh, but we have also uh, two engineers uh, and then uh, people economics uh, degrees, people with political science degrees. So we have, uh, it's a kind of multi, uh, uh, multi issue team, no? So how, how did that I end working in a consultancy? Well, this is a, a long story, but well, in 2005, so I, I finished my degree on July, I my degree, my PhD in July, but from the, the last uh, January, I started working, I enrolled uh, a small company, a uh, technological company and, and research and development company uh, based in the Barcelona Scientific Park. And I was supposed to coordinate uh, research projects, more or less related with my expertise uh, in, in that uh, moment, no? which was DNA structure and DNA intercalators. Uh, well, this kind of, of science that I had been performing during my PhD. Uh, but what happened at the end, I figured out that I was working most of the time helping the CEO, the chief executive officer of the company in management aspects and not as much as I would like in coordinating scientific projects. But uh, so after a year and a half, I, I have to admit that I, I liked no? uh, working on this stuff, on management. At, at the beginning, it was a little bit disappointing no? or, or surprising because it, it was not the thing that I know how to do. And it was not what I was supposed to do when I enrolled the company. But at the end, I kind of like it. And then, well, I, so I took interest in management aspects. And I, I feel myself, uh, what uh, should I do to, to go deeper in this, in this area of, of management aspects? No? And, and when talking with people, uh, I was given to advice, even to do an MBA or enroll a consultancy firm. No? Uh, doing an MBA, I, I didn't consider it because it was very expensive and just after a PhD, I, I wanted to, to really start working. So, so I took the second option and was enrolled. Uh, I enrolled in 2007, I think, uh, a multinational firm, which is PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, which is a business consultancy. And I spent there around a year, which was really interesting because I, I learned how to work. Uh, well, I, I learned the basic things of the consultancy, of the consultancy business. And I, I really liked it, I enjoyed it. No? Uh, from the very beginning, I, it was really strange uh, myself there because uh, all the people came most from economics or yeah, maybe economics, law, this kind of degrees, and no one had uh, a PhD. But I really uh, take notice that the PhD uh, helped me to progress uh, really faster than the other ones because I have a series of skills that the other ones uh, didn't have, no, with, with only the degree. I will review it later, but anyway, uh, I was happy there. I, I liked uh, the kind of jobs, different projects, uh, always changing, no? Uh, and well, and a friend or yeah, a, a mate uh, that was working there at Prezer House Coopers, he moved to Momentum and he uh, asked me, well, he, he think that the Momentum was a, a good opportunity. And tried to get me also at Momentum and I, I follow her, him, her, his advice and I moved to Momentum. So I started Momentum at 2008, 2009 with a public sector consultancy. 
Uh, in PricewaterhouseCoopers, I work with companies. They're in Momentum. So for the last 11 years, I've worked with uh, public sector companies and nonprofit organizations. So um, there I was working, I worked uh, since 2015 when Momentum split into different companies. And I was quite senior at the time uh, within the team. And me and two other partners, uh, so create Momentum Co, which is basically the same that we did uh, with Momentum, but but well, but uh, now I'm one of the partners, apart of working uh, also as a consultancy. I mean, we are partners, but we did the same job that we did before, but with more responsibility in the way that you have to pay wage and. And you have to, well, you're, you're responsible for the incomes of the company. No? Uh, and the last four years of my life, I've been working there. Uh, as I told you, uh, public sector, so the cli our clients are uh, municipalities, other public uh, administration organizations. Then we work also on museums. We work uh, networks of organizations also. And in my case, since my, or due to my, my background, I have al always tried to uh, perform projects uh, around research or research management, no? because it's a, it's a topic that I, I really like and I'm really interested and I know how, uh, a little bit. No? And well, I've been quite successful in, in this in this in this topic, and well, I, I have been able to perform several projects in research uh, centers, such as, for example, helping them to to take a, a award of uh, excellence uh, human resources management or helping them to draw up the process map of how to manage uh, clinical trials, for example. I will help them uh, in strategic planning. So, well, I, I've done some of the projects related in a way to, to research and science. Uh, I also helped uh, a group of, of uh, pulmonologists of structure a network uh, which is now Barcelona uh, Respiratory Network Foundation uh, which is devoted to uh, streamline and boost uh, research in the field of respiratory health and since I helped them to create the foundation then they asked me to manage a little bit the foundation so that's why I I also appear as executive consultant because it's the title that they gave me. But actually, I'm like the manager of the foundation uh, and we organize seminars, uh, research seminars. We, we run a, um, a revista. And, well, we run a journal, a research journal. Uh, so, well, we, we do several things and I help them with this thing. Uh, just uh, finally, I, I would like to review a little bit the, the skills that I think that I got in during my PhD and that has helped me in, in, the, in my career, even though my career have uh, evolved in a, in a sector that has nothing to do with, with science uh, strictly. No? But uh, these skills could be uh, documentation reviewing. This is a thing that during the PhD you, you review a lot, a lot, a lot of documentation and you're, you learn how to extract the important information or the important issues of a lot of um, documentation. So this is a thing that in the consultancy you have to do a lot. You have to read a lot, uh, a lot of different documents, a lot of different minutes of, uh, of meetings, a lot of uh, yeah, documentation and take the essential of, of them, no? take the, the, the key issues of them in which then you build the, the strategy of the organization. No? Uh, second skill, uh, plan and a structure work. No? 
PhDs uh, four years uh, project and you have to plan. You have to plan uh, every day, every week. And it's a thing that we, in the degree, it's different. No? I think that the planning that you learn during the PhD has nothing to do with the degree one. No? So, and, and plan tasks and structure work is a thing that uh, consultancy, well, consultants have to do. I'm now working at the same time in between eight and 10 projects. So uh, you have to, to be able to structure your time in that way. Uh, third thing, third skill that I think it's very important and I learned it uh, during the PhD is to write. It, uh, it seems silly, but it, it's not. Eh? It's not easy to write. It's not easy to write concisely and to, to structure ideas and uh, put them on black and white in a paper. And consultants, we produce a lot of documents. So writing, it's really essential in our work. And the PhD helped me a lot on that. Eh? Then, uh, other things would be uh, think, uh, to face challenges no? and, and, and to think about different options, how to, how to manage in a, when you get difficulty, no? how to overcome the difficulty, how to face these challenges. This is a thing that uh, PhD is an everyday challenge no? because well, at least in my case, it was uh, every day, no? you tried an experiment, it failed, uh, another experiment, it failed again. Uh, it was a little bit disappointing at the beginning, but then you learn how to overcome the difficulties, how to change the focus, how to uh, face the challenges that the, that the experiments are, uh, are given to you. And, and, and this thing with consultancy, it's very similar. I mean, every project has a lot of challenges and a lot of difficulties and you have to, to manage them and to overcome them. And finally, uh, maybe the two last ones that I have uh, note here is the ability of, of asking yourself questions. I mean, uh, during the PhD, you keep asking yourself questions about, uh, it's related with, uh, with the challenges and difficulties. Eh? But for me, it's, it's very important to ask, uh, ask your, I, I think that in the degree, you learn how to answer questions. But in the PhD, you learn how to ask questions. And in my work, it's really, really important to be able to identify the right questions to ask. And this is very similar to, to science, no? And you have to ask the, yourself uh, how to, well, how to uh, go further with a project, how to how to structure one thing, how to, uh, which is the, the objective of this document, no? who's going to read it, how, a, a lot of questions. There are different questions, eh? of course, between scientific ones and, and, and the ones I, I ask myself uh, in my job, but I'm constantly asking questions about things. No? And the last one, but not the least, of course, is to be persistent and, and really, keep on track uh, uh, of, of the project, no? I mean, you have to work, 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 and then you see results, no? And this is, this is a thing that the PhD, since it lasts uh, between four and five years, uh, it gives you this persistency, no? In a way, and, and not, to, not to quit uh, things when, when it doesn't work, but to really reinforce, uh, you in 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 willing uh, in the willingness to to really overcome these difficulties. Uh, more or less, that's what I what I planned to share with you. Uh, more or less, it's uh, no, 15 minutes, which is what we told. Uh, I, I was told. So, Donna, if you feel it's okay. Yes, thank you very much, John. And then if anybody when we has the questions, exactly. Partners. We've been we've been already collecting some of the questions, so John will be will be back to to answer those when when the other speakers finish. Thank you. Okay. So now I would like to invite uh, Sonia to please. Exactly there she is. Hi. 
Let me see. Okay, very good. Thank you. So first, thank you for inviting me. I think it's really nice this type of webinars that are very relaxed and very um, practical. Well, not practical in the sense of hands-on, but very with real experience. So thank you for organizing this for BIST. I wish I had this before. Um, so actually, I, I am also a, I have a PhD in biomedicine here in Barcelona, and um, I did the, this shift in career uh, not so long ago, less than two years ago. So it's, everything is really fresh, the science part. Yet. Uh, I actually did two postdocs. So I have to say that I tried different ways to stay in the academia that didn't work for me. I tried, uh, I started by doing basic research and then I moved into a very, very clinical setting. It was not optimal either. Then I tried translational research and I find, I found different problems in the three uh, situations, but the, the things that maybe we sort of thinking about a different career were more or less the same. So there is an overall lack of direct impact on with what you do. And that I think many people that work especially on basic research feel a little bit sometimes. And I, I, don't, th I don't think you think about it every day, but it, it is in the back of your head when people ask you if you're curing cancer or not, these type of things. And also the, the lack of uh, short-term stimulus that it's positive. I mean, this story with all the publications and the, you have to have it and all the stress, for me, it was not a positive stimulus to continue doing the research. I don't know if I, if I make sense, but... And then the third thing is, of course, you have to think about your... Uh, I'm not saying the personal life, but your life journey, let's call it. And the opportunities in the academia right now either are very slim, so if you to become a professor is super, super difficult, or the positions of researchers are also very uh, uh, few. And there is no like alternative paths inside that. Either you go for being a PI or there is nothing else, at least in Spain. There are not a, lot of, a lot of like staff researchers or people that do research at a high level <clears throat> that can, that maybe you don't aspire to be a PI because that's also a more of a personal commitment, but you like what you do. And there you don't have a lot of room to to be in that situation. Maybe in other countries you have, but um, certainly not, not here in Spain, because then the other option is to become a technician and then you start, you may be lucky and find a position in, as technician that's well paid, that it's valorized, but many times this type of um, positions end up being uh, infra-valorized, in my opinion, either by, by the, the salary and by the credit that they have on, on the work that it's being done. So that's one of my, I started thinking about a little bit outside, outside of the box. And as I will repeat, or I'll try not to repeat a lot of the things that Juan has said, but it's true that I didn't knew that consultancy was an option either, either. I have to say the first time I heard about consultancy being an option for the, basically any type of career is when I attended a, a open day in Esade, because again, People are telling me maybe you should do an MBA. And again, it's too expensive. It's a lot of effort and time invested. But I went there for an open day. And uh, basically, that is when they said that consultancy is when where a lot of people with higher education can have a, um, a career independently of exactly what you have done. As if, it's your, if you are a biologist or an informatician or whatever, an economist which is a more classic consultancy. So then I found, I found this position in, in Cities Academic, where I am now. This question about do you need uh, more um, training to work in consultancy? My opinion is you don't. Maybe you need if you go for these very classic uh, consultancy companies, but uh, in all the rest, which are more, more, much more interesting, you, you really don't. What I would say to everyone is this uh, also buzzword about networking is totally true. I don't believe in networking per networking just by making connections, but you, it's how you know about different opportunities and different type of people that do interesting things. And in my case, it was the classic example of a, a friend of a friend works there. They need some, actually I started doing like a part-time solution because they needed some, someone in the biomedical 
with a bit of medical expertise to help them, them a bit in a project and then from that it scale, scale up to like a, a full full job so don't don't shut the door on knowing people and people that do things different from what different areas from what uh, you are doing currently because we tend to stick uh, to the lab and to that group of researchers that we know and we don't really see a lot of things on the side so if i have really one advice is to do cultivate your contacts outside of, of research also. Of course, if you want, if you are very convinced that you want to do a BI and stay in academia, of course, it's also relevant to know a lot of researchers and to have a lot of contacts all over the world, but it's not the, the only thing. And you never know how that will uh, return to you. So in, in Series Academic, in the company that I, I work now, it's a consultancy company. It's not very big, but right now we are expanding a lot. So we are close to 30 people. When I arrived, we were 20, so we have been growing, which is a very nice size. And I'm sure many of you have worked in labs of that size. <clears throat> and I have to say that in my personal experience, the, uh, the environment is very similar because it's a lot of different uh, ages, tendently, normally a little bit on the younger side, everyone is very active and like you have the very, uh, the working space is very common, you're always talking with everyone all the time. So it's a very active and engaging environment. It's also nice. For me, it reminded me a bit of the lab, but I have to say the difference is that maybe in the lab you're, it may be weird, but you're more alone when you're doing experiments because if you're very concentrated on your task, you can be like days that you really don't need to share what you're doing with someone else. Maybe you do because maybe you have a, a postdoc or someone that is really close to you, but maybe you don't. And that's one of the things that in consultancy in general, you really go for the teamwork to the, to the fullest. And it's real teamwork. It's not like in the lab that you ask for a little bit of advice or help with an experiment. It's real that the, normally the projects, at least how we do it in series, the projects involve a lot of people and a lot of people with different back backgrounds. Because actually what we do is kind of similar of uh, um, the company of Joanne. We do what it's called strategic consultancy. In our case, we are specialized in higher education and research and innovation. So the thing is that that involves either instit institutions like a university per se, or research centers, or funders of research. So we do work with the three types. So we, we like to say that we work with the funders, the people that fund this, the research, but also the people that perform it, either if they are a university or research center or networks, uh, again, more or less the same as uh, was said before. And our, our, mo our way of working is what we call data-driven. So we, <clears throat> if a client comes with a question or Sometimes, as John said, we, you, ha you have to think about the questions. Many times the client doesn't even know exactly what they need. They say, I, I want to understand better this question or this like, context, but they don't have the exact questions and you have to do that work for them, which is also quite, quite interesting. And then what we do is we have uh, a team that includes uh, a lot of people uh, dedicated to data and we try to to come up with data that will hint you in the right direction for strategy. So sometimes strategy is only based on like bibliography and past case, past cases, case studies, this type of things. We try to bring some data to help guide the, the decisions. And uh, the team that we have right now, we have the great majority are PhDs. Um, we have from uh, astrophysics to, well, I'm a biologist, uh, we have archeologists, we have a lot of physicians and people more from the computer sciences area, we have a lot of that. We also have like designers because sometimes the solutions that we give to clients is like a, a, a dashboard. So like a very cool web page in which they can explore their own data or specific types of data that they want to have access on a, um, like an updated manner and a read, uh, easy manner. And uh, that's why we have also a team that takes care of all these more technical aspects. And then we try to pair also always with a consultant 
profile, which is more expert in the field. So in my case, I take all the projects that are more related to biomedical research or health, health research. Normally they end up <coughs> with me. But we also have people that are more um, specialized on um, education and they get uh, more projects with universities, which is a, a little di different context, but we try to cover um, all of that. For, cli for spe specific clients, we work with a lot of universities, for example, in France, in Italy, here also in Spain, at research centers, and we also have many clients that are non-for-profit funders, like foundations that uh, support research. And that opens all the, another uh, big, big discussion now, which is about uh, the impact of research. What, what does it mean, the impact of research? How can I measure it? How can I become better when I do my funding? And this is all the thematics that we, we work a lot. Uh, and also with this uh, situation we are right now, we have a lot of um, contacts and requests of people that want to know more about, about this, this, uh, this, um, this topic. Because even for the funders right now, it's a very critical point to say, okay, I'm, I can give now a lot of money to COVID, that will take away from other projects. I don't know what's the long-term and middle-term impact. Uh, what happens next week, next year if I'm a philanthropic funder or a patient um, group and I don't have enough um, money to, to continue funding? So there are a ton of questions on the table right now that, uh, that we would like to, to work on. And this, it's not science per se, <clears throat> but many times it demands some type of... Um, um, knowledge of the of the what we call the ecosystem, which is not a very for me at the beginning was a very funny funny word. But you have to understand who is who. So who is funding? Who is doing the research? If you touch in this side, how that will impact the whole context? And this is very um, a big big topic right now. And even if, as I was saying, if it's not, you're not doing research per se, in my case, my background on in health research and biomedical research. I mean, I, you could not give advice if you don't understand, even with data, you have to understand what uh, the context. So I have to say that, uh, for example, I don't know, clinical trials in um, chronic diseases are uh, a lot more prone to have a private uh, sponsor. And everyone, for me, it's obvious, of course, if it's a chronic disease, it's of much more interest for uh, private partners. If it's uh, other areas of research in uh, underdeveloped countries or that uh, out of uh, patent drugs, it's much more uh, common to have clinical trials with um, public funding. So this type of argumentation, you, you need some background to do it. And this is what you have when you have done a PhD in a specific area. And that, no one can take that away from you, even if you leave, if you leave the science. And then, the, the other question that I used to think a lot is how, how different is it going to be like my work-life balance? Because we have this idea that you work a lot in the lab, but maybe you will also work, you won't work as much as in a private company because you'll do nine to five. That's absolutely not true in consultancy. So you have a client, so you also have, always have a, um, a deadline or like a, something that you have to do for, the, for that client if you want to provide the best service. To, that you that you can and since we are researchers and i see this with everyone everyone that works in cities that has done more than two or three years in research you always want to do your best and you are not satisfied until that is correctly done and uh, many times my <clears throat> one of my supervisor has to tell me we cannot do it perfectly this is what we are working with so move on and don't get stuck but uh, on the contrary, it's a positive thing because we are very driven to detail and to be, make sure that if we show a data that entails this interpretation, we then will lead to a, a resolution, a decision making. You want to be sure that that's correct. And normally when you do research, you, you want to have the, the right data, you do the triplicates or how many you need to do to make sure that uh, you're not inventing something or it's an artifact. So that type of mentality, I think it's really useful and keeps you responsible because you are really touching sometimes very sensitive topics. You may have, I mean, you can have, you may have a client in which you do a study and say, I think you should do A and then they do Zeta. Okay. But if they take your, your advice, that will have an impact. 
I mean, you're not going to destroy the world, but that, that will have a, a, a more short-term impact. And that's also the good thing of doing consultancy, that you have short-term goals, you have short, mid, and long-term um, impact, that sometimes in research is very really, uh, difficult to, to get there. And uh, well, this is more, more or less it about the what is commonly called the transverse skills that Joanne was talking about. I think he was totally right. Everything that has to do with communication, you're supposed to be really uh, advanced right now, either oral communication or, or written communication. Everything has to do with finding information, compiling information, being synthetic. I think at least I learned a lot during my, my PhD, uh, doing all, all these tasks. And then, as I was saying, we have like this uh, scientific method. So we are very critical about the things. We have to make sure, we want to, make, to be sure that what we are saying is right. We have critical thinking, and, but we are also like solution driven. When you, for me, at least my experience, experience in biomedical research, sometimes if you make a mistake when you're doing experiments, you have to react really rapidly and make a, make a decision because you don't have time to start uh, making a thesis on the errors. You really have to, to, to go ahead and make a decision and solve the problem that you have. If you would like to do an experiment and your institute doesn't have the, the, the machinery or you have to go to Iran, you won't go to Iran. So you'll find another way of doing the experiment or a way around to have an answer to that question. That's, I think that's also very, um, you also flex that muscle a lot when, when you do the PhD in general, of course. And then I, the things that I would say that we are probably not so well equip, equipped with are uh, real time management and uh, project management, which is more about time, managing time and people. And then I know that many of you have had uh, PhD students, if you're a postdoc or you had a uh, um, um, master's students, but imagine that by 10. And, very bit different profiles because I have to talk with an, uh, an IT person and I have to talk with uh, someone who is, uh, we have a couple of PhDs in philosophy that also have always have a different perspective on, on things and you have to organize them and characters and okay layers of complexity but uh, for me uh, for me it works maybe you can think if you have a personal character or personality that fits this and that may, might be uh, a thing, but uh, in general, I think it's a, it's a nice experience. And also the fact that the teamwork here is much, much, for me, is much, much real than, than it was in, in the lab. And also when I was saying before, when you work in clients, I always remember that when I did the first like semi-interview for this job, I asked, what do you do? Because consultancy literally is giving an opinion okay we do opinion with data so it's more supported i get that and then he told me this is one part but maybe 80 percent and i don't think it's so much it depends exactly what you do a big part of the job is also understanding the psychology of the client so you have to know how to talk with people to get them to understand your point or take the argument in the right direction and uh, of course, at the end, you are a private company, so you have to have a profit and you have to have a constant flow of uh, projects and um, institutions working with you. So this is a, like a long-term commitment to being a friend, not friendly in the wrong way, but you have to, to know how to engage with people and at all levels, because you may be talking to a high director of uh, a foundation or a center, or you can be talking with people that are doing the management and I we had these situations when we have to talk with people that compile the data of a foundation or a research center. And these people normally are not very motivated to work with you because what you're asking them is data that then you will analyze, but for them it's extra work. So you have to be careful and you have to learn more how to literally speak and make people uh, maybe be a little bit manipulative some ways, but in a positive way, no? So that they feel good about what they're doing and they feel that this is relevant, they will work with you better and then the end result of the project is, is gonna be um, much better. So um, yeah, I will be happy to take questions at the end. I hope it was useful. I mean, on, on a daily basis, we basically do 
I feel what what I do. I many times we do like reports for let's say a research institute, and they ask. I don't know exactly what I am doing. First, they don't, clients don't know what they're doing in the case of uh, foundations and research centers and university. I'm talking about research, okay? They don't know what they do in research because you're talking about, you're talking with the president of a university, a big university, and he doesn't have the picture of what they do. And then, for example, they don't know, okay, if I'm, now I found out that I'm super specialized in one area or I'm super good because I have two groups on this topic. I don't know who else is working on that. Can I make a collaboration with them? Can I find partners? Can I find alliances for European funding and all these type of things? So these are many of the questions that we answer. And then the, the, the projects with the funders is all about, which is a very important question and big question, where do I put my money? Why am I funding Alzheimer's and I'm not funding cancer or I'm not funding uh, tropical diseases, which is a big discussion. And for example, we also have a new line of projects right now that it's uh, helping PhD students. So we have done a training um, program for PhD students, for example. And when I took on the project, I thought, how am I going to do this? I'm not a specialized, I don't have a background in education or anything. And I looked at the previous uh, program. And as a PhD student, I said, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is in the wrong timing. I don't want to know about patterns in year one, please, out. I don't want to, I want to talk about uh, things like this for future uh, options, uh, time management, how to write a paper. You know, sometimes it's difficult to see when you're doing, you're so in the lab, what the things that you have really learned. But when you take a step, not back or, or in front, when you take a step on the side, you really see that you have learned so much in these years. So I think, uh, I know the situation right now, it's a little bit uh, unnerving, but uh, I think everyone should be positive because I'm sure you have done great PhDs in BEAST and uh, you'll be prepared for a great future. Thank you. Waiting for the questions later. Thank you so much, Sonia. Yes, as you said, we will get back to you with, with some of the questions that we're getting. And last but not least, we have Anna, who also wants to share her experience. Thank you, Anna. Hi. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to share my screen because um, I prepared some slides. Let me check. Yeah, here we go. So can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? I can hear you. Yes, yes, thank you, Anna. Everything's perfect. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm Anna Valdivia. I'm a data scientist at Trilateral as a company based in London. And I'm going to talk a bit of uh, my career and why I finally decided to um, go, go to work with the company and, uh, and stop uh, collaborating with um, the, the universities and academia and, and so on. So um, I started studying um, mathematics, Bachelor of Mathematics at uh, University uh, Politecnica of Catalonia. And when I graduated, I moved to ESA, which is a private uh, university also based in, in Barcelona, where I was a research assistant. And I could say that that was my first experience working with data. Uh, we collaborate with two museums of uh, Barcelona and we create a predictive model that estimates the number of uh, visitors within the, uh, those museums. And uh, there I felt like my, I had a good motivation towards uh, data science and I wanted to study more about that and to be more uh, experienced in this area. And because of that, they moved to uh, the city of Granada in the south of Spain where I study a master in uh, data science and uh, computer engineering. And after that, my PhD advisor, who was also my, my, my supervisor in my uh, master thesis, offers me to study uh, a PhD uh, with him at the University of, of Granada too. And then I study my, my PhD in sentiment analysis, which are um, tools that um, are developed to extract and analyze opinion from a given text. And I focus this this PhD like uh, in a very like in 
to have a, a social impact because I was working for analyzing opinions of uh, cultural heritage and to know what visitors uh, thought about um, those, those cultural monuments and how they can improve the visitor experience. Um, but um, although my, my PhD thesis was very like, you know, um, it had like a real application, I found that my results in the PhD was uh, were only papers. Papers are and, and, and going, going to conferences and uh, communicate my, my, my research. But I didn't have any experience on working together with a museum or a cultural monument. Um, and I have to say also that uh, within uh, my PhD, I was um, shortlisted for uh, the Data Science for Social Good uh, Fellowship at the, the University of, of Chicago where I was working in a project uh, during three months, partnering together with a uh, um, public um, government of uh, uh, the Ministry of Education of El Salvador. And uh, they wanted us to identify the main factors that drive and drop outs within all the schools of uh, this country. And I have to say that um, in, in this project, I learned um, how to work together with uh, governments, with uh, policy makers. And I discovered the challenge on doing so because, you know, when uh, you are working, uh, you are preparing a paper, you just analyze your data, uh, run your models, and publish your paper. But, the, but it, like the papers, uh, um, you publish a paper and you move to another project and uh, the impact that this paper has on society is merely like nothing. And within this project, I discovered that I could apply all my knowledge in uh, all, my, all my knowledge and, and understanding on uh, data science and, and machine learning and artificial intelligence to do um, a real impact on society and to collaborate together with the stakeholders and, uh, and uh, policy makers. So because of that, when um, I finished my PhD in uh, February um, last year, I um, decided, I, I had to decide what to do. If um, staying in the academia, looking for postdocs, or just moving to the private sector and uh, start in, uh, collaborating in projects like uh, that one at the University of Chicago. So I talked with a lot of my um, colleagues in, uh, at university. I talked with uh, some other colleagues from the university, which are uh, working with uh, private in the, in the are working in the private sector. And I also um, I remember to have a conversation with the director of the Data Science for Social Good Project, and he asked me, "Do you want to have a real uh, the, your work?" Uh, to have a real uh, impact on society, and I say yes, I really want to. I, I really seek to do so. And he answered, "Then you have to move out of the academia." And then I got. I remember that I got two offers from for a postdoc at universities in Europe, and then uh, a, a position in in trilateral. And then um, I was. I, I I remember myself to have like few weeks thinking on what to do. And here um, I have exposed um, my thoughts over, over this week when I was deciding uh, what to do if uh, staying in the university of moving out of, of, of the academia. And then I figured out that, um, so the positive values or moving to the sector is um, that I, I, I could work in a cross-disciplinary work uh, in a cross-disciplinary um, team, like uh, in when I was working in my PhD, I was mainly uh, working in my papers, in my papers with myself. I was not collaborating with other um, members of, of the department or of my group. And then the company offers me to work in a in a cross-disciplinary team together with uh, social scientists, uh, lawyers, ethical experts, and I was, I was really willing to do so. After that, um, they also um, offered me to work in a real uh, project with real data, uh, with uh, a real um, impact on society. And I'm gonna explain to you later, um, I'm gonna describe uh, this, this project where, where I'm working on. 
and uh, finally, yeah, so create real solutions. That was what I was uh, looking for. On the other hand, um, I also consider that uh, the disadvantages of leading academia was that I'm not gonna teach anymore. So I really enjoy uh, going to a, to a class and you know communicate and your 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 ideas and uh, your your thoughts on, on the theory of machine learning or artificial intelligence. Also, not going to conferences. I really enjoy going to conferences and you know uh, meet new people and uh, create networks and share your uh, work. Although I have to say that in my company, in trilateral uh, research, I'm allowed to do so because they know that I'm very like uh, I, I really enjoy uh, to go to conferences and to learn new things and new trends. So um, they allow me to to go to conferences. And finally. Um, and, and that was a hard uh, decision because this point, because I think that in Spain, when you move out of uh, the academia after your PhD, it's harder to come back to the academia. I mean, um, they don't really um, evaluate, evaluate or, yeah, they don't really see that when you move from one side to the other side, you know, you have a broad um, perspective of, of everything, like, um, you can give more and more value into the universities with having like this experience in the private sector. But here in Spain, it seems like um, the, the administration is uh, not really taking into account this, this, this point. So, but I have to say that out of Spain, they really value when uh, you are moving in between uh, academia, universities and the private sector. So coming back to a sp to Spanish academia is harder, I, I consider it's harder. Um, so I finally decided to uh, go to uh, trilateral research and then to move to London and working there since uh, October, October last year, I'm a data scientist. And uh, trilateral is a company that is defined um, as uh, we work in uh, projects, in data-driven projects, in cross-disciplinary uh, teams because so it's important to create that, um, data solutions, data-driven solutions, but equally important is to discuss those solutions with uh, your um, ethical and legal experts. Because as we have seen recently, um, some of these solutions can have some um, harms on society. And to avoid this, it's uh, really important. I would say that it's a must to, um, you know, collaborate in this in these cross-disciplinary teams so that you have um, discussions on the solutions that you are building and you have discussions on the ethical implications of uh, these solutions. And I have to say that I really enjoy to have these discussions because you see um, projects from different perspectives and it, I think that it enriches the solution. Um, yeah, another, another thing important to say is that in every project, we uh, write uh, an ethical impact assessment document where we um, describe all the harms and the possible wrong solutions on how, or, on, or, or um, how people can do damage with our data driven solutions, which I think that is essential when you are um, when you are working with with data in order to avoid those um, harms that artificial intelligence is having on on society on on, on people. So um, now I'm going to present you three projects to have like a, a real idea on uh, the project that I'm working on. And the first is Striat. So Striat is a solution that uh, we are building. Um, um, it encompasses like uh, different sub projects within, within Striat. And uh, mainly, uh, or basically, Striat is a data-driven solution. Uh, reflected on a dashboard. So we are building a dashboard that helps uh, the end users to, to, to find the answer to, to the questions. And uh, within uh, Striad, we have great different solutions, uh, mainly related with uh, modern library, child exploitation, collaborating with uh, public uh, uh, servants and uh, governments. 
And in, now I'm collaborating in the Hammock project where we are partnering with the Ministry of Defense of uh, United Kingdom. And uh, we are creating uh, a data driving solution for um, understanding uh, what are the main vulnerabilities and risk in uh, conflict areas. So when uh, the military wants to go to uh, an area uh, that has been like a disaster, it could be like a war or it could be a natural disaster, they need to be informed about this country. Where are the hospitals? Which NGOs are working in there so that they can collaborate together? So this um, project is based on creating a solution to answer um, those, those, those questions. Um, yeah, this is more about Hammock. And then uh, recently I, I collaborated in, a, in another project which uh, was titled Crime on Adolescent Mental Health. And we were partnering with Guys on Thomas Charity, which is a charity based in London. And uh, they wanted to ask to analyze or identif identify the relationship between crime and mental health uh, on adolescents in order to discover uh, which is the uh, causality relation, which factors are um, affecting the mental health of adolescents in, in some districts in London, uh, London. And to do so, uh, we create another um, dashboard showing um, different uh, correlation, correlations between socio, um, socioeconomical factors and uh, where else, and then different also demographic and uh, mental health um, features and everything uh, related with, uh, so this, this all, the, all these variables um, and, uh, analyzing the, 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 the relationship between all these variables together with, with the crime levels at each um, area of, of United Kingdom and con concretely in, in, in London. And uh, so finally, um, this, uh, we, we are running another project together with partnering with the University of La Sabana, uh, Colombia, and it's the uh, Child Soldiers in Colombia. And in this project, we have, um, we have a data set with uh, the, the testimonies of uh, child children that have been recruit, uh, recruited by, um, by legal and um, groups uh, either paramilitars or others in, in Colombia. And uh, we have the text of these children where they are explaining how they were um, recruited, where, how, uh, who was the person who um, pursued him to, to enroll these illegal um, groups. And uh, what we wanted to do with um, this um, information is to apply um, natural language processing tools, which are um, uh, artificial intelligence um, solutions that are able to uh, find patterns within text, with, which is considered unstructured um, data, because when you have a text, it's not like a database where you have the columns and the rows, you only have words, and uh, you have to uh, clean and work on this um, unstructured data in order to find uh, patterns and trends. So um, this is everything and um, thank you for, for attending this presentation and I'm willing to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Anna. Maybe if you can and stop sharing your screen. We can see the three of you for the Q and A. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna do so. Thank you. Thank you for for your insights to the three of you. It was a it was a great pleasure listening to your experience and and everything you're involved in right now. So we can start with the Q and A. I have put together the questions that we've been receiving through the chat uh, that the audience has been giving us, and we'll try our best to discuss them all given the, the time limitation that we have. But if we don't have enough time uh, to go through all of them, we also encourage you to please contact us at, at the VIST email, which is info at vist.eu. We'll be more than happy to send them your question or to put you in touch with the speakers.
So the first question would be a very practical one, which would be, which is the salary range that you can find in consultancy, especially after a PhD? Who starts? Well, uh, if you want, I can start. Uh, that depends on the sector and on the country, of course, no? I mean, uh, maybe it's not the same in England, I'm sure, no? Like, uh, or, or here in Spain, no? Uh, in my case, uh, even having the PhD, I started as a junior uh, completely. So uh, I, so, I, I do a, a previous reflection. I, I think that in general, uh, consultancy firms don't evaluate uh, PhD as itself, uh, at least uh, now. So, so they see you as a, a, an older person than uh, one that has just finished the degree and with more or less uh, some some more uh, knowledge uh, of a specific uh, field. But if the consultancy you go is not uh, specifically of the field you have uh, been working on the PhD, uh, and it applies in my case, maybe it's not the same with data science no? and, and other cases, but in my case, you're just treated like a junior. Uh, so I don't know now, I'm a small company, so I don't know now the salaries in in big companies, but I would say that starting from 25, uh, between 22, 25,000 euros per year. And then it's really, well, it's real that in the consultancy, in these big consultancy firms, the salary can, can improve uh, a lot in a few years. I mean, there's a policy which is up or out, no? and it's very competitive uh, environment. And the ones that, that give value to the company, they go up very quickly and with uh, maybe 20% increase of salaries every year at the, the first years. Uh, and the ones that don't, don't give this uh, value, as a value, they, they are out, no? But in my case, it, the PhD was not valuated, so I started, I think, around 19,000 euros, it was 15 years ago, eh? so it has changed a lot. But as a, as a people, as a person who has just finished the degree, I don't know what's your no. opinion, Anna and Sonia? Well, no, I, I, as Juan said, I don't know the salary in other companies, so I can only speak for, for mine and for a couple of examples that I know of. And I think uh, it should be if they, uh, as John said, consider the PhD as a plus, and maybe he's right, it has to be in an area, a specific area that are in need of, so you're not starting from doing whatever, you're starting already as a junior consultant in a specific area, or with a specific expertise, in case of data analysis, I think you should be aiming for 30, mid 30, at least 35, something like that. This, this is my experience, and I think, I mean, tw around 20, it seems, I mean, I, I know that you already said the time lapse is, <laughs> is in the past, but uh, yeah, right now, I know that there are consultancy companies that, that may exploit more. Well, I don't know. This is my personal experience. I would say in mid-30s. Yeah, so I only can ex like um, explain my, my experience. And in the data science area, like we are very demanding, now, like we have a lot of uh, um, job offers. So, and but the salary really depends on the size of the company. So my company is not very huge, and my salary is around uh, 40, 50,000 um, uh, pounds um, uh, per year. and. Uh, yeah, I would say that it really depends on the company. But yeah, of course, I mean, you are going to earn more, uh, like your salary is going to be higher uh, if you are working for a private company than if uh, you are in, a, uh, in the academia. So because, um, yep. yeah, everybody knows that right? in the private sector, you're going to earn more money. Yep. And I agree with Anna that data people are very on demand in consulting. So, 
know that? Uh, Maybe it's an option for you. Yeah, I know that. Um, yeah, but I have my constraints because I wouldn't never work for a bank. Uh, I have friends that are working for a bank and they are earning like a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. So what I was, yeah, what I was going to say is that like Anna, like pick the type of company or the type of topics that you like. Because and if you feel that the environment is nice, I have this relationship with my data people, as we call them, and uh, I like to explain them the project. So if they understand, even if they have a data background or mathematics or informatics or whatever, they are involved in the project. They like what we do, so they want to be involved. And sometimes they come with solutions and ideas that I wouldn't have thought knowing having the expertise. So yeah. that's also very fun yeah. for them. So yeah. Yeah, so yeah, those are the numbers. Like people that who's working in, in, in a bank start um their salary starts at um eighty thousand per year. So yeah. And maybe it's also different between countries. Eh? I mean in England yeah. salaries mm -hmm. are quite are quite are higher than here and maybe life is quite ex more expensive than here. Yeah, I could say so. I could say so that I'm paying my rent in London and it's incredible, like it's it's crazy. No, but I, I agree with Sonia. Maybe here in in Spain, if uh, so, your background is related to the work. Maybe starting with mid thirties, it's it's the normal yes. thing. Eh? Mm -hmm. If it's not started, uh, if it's not related, since it will not be much valued, maybe it will be lower. Mid twenties could be. So in, in my field, that there are a lot of political science people working a salary, starting salary of 25 uh, for a political science uh, degree is, is quite good uh, because they, they don't have uh, as much opportunity of higher salaries at the beginning of their careers, no? So mm -hmm. it depends of, uh, no, and size of the company, sector, relation with your background and country, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to the next question. Uh, we speak a lot about the skills that are required to become a consultant, but this would be what are the skills that you acquire as a consultant? Well, I think I touched uh, a little bit before. So you have this different uh, psychological mindset. You have to learn to talk to people and to bring them into your uh, perspective. And that I think it's the major thing. And then it's the real teamwork. So, and that is a little bit the same. You have to be more empathetic with people to make the thing, the project work. I think that's for me. It was the big, uh, the big difference. And then, of course, it's a commercial world, and you're also selling a product at the end. So that's also part that you have to shift your mind a little bit into that. But if you work for a company that has their uh, like social goals, normally it's not a negative thing. So it's not something that you have to think about every day, or it's just like you work in a bank. It's not that. But it's of course it's different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah, I agree completely with Sonia. I may add. Uh, so apart from this commercial point of view, that I think that it's it's important. Maybe not at the beginning, beginning, but when you, well, in my case, since I'm a partner, uh, I have to be on that. No, but uh, it's it's the thing that if you do uh, a right job and a good job, they will. Uh, rebuy you something no so so you have to keep this in mind but also is that maybe the, the the relationship with the client is a kind of relationship that maybe it's difficult to 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 know from uh, uh, from the academic world no and this kind of trust that you uh, you try to build between the client and your uh, and, and your team no is is an intangible thing that it's very important for I think for growing in the in this field. Yeah, and I have to add to this that um, some of this, these skills I'm still learning. I'm I'm still learning how to communicate with the client. So you don't have to have these skills per se. Like you can't learn while you are working. So. Yeah, and of course there's tip different types of person come up with different solutions for the same thing so it doesn't have that you have to fit the mold of being a consultancy you might do it in a different way and it works just as fine or it works with different types of clients because of course everyone is different so one one uh, uh, formula doesn't fit all for sure 
and yeah. maybe the other the other skill that I think that that uh, you learn a lot in consultancy, at least if you work in little companies, maybe in big companies since they have big projects is different. Eh? But in little companies, you have small projects or medium projects, and you have to work on different projects at the same time, no? And it's not. <laughs> It's not easy at the beginning, no, because you have a lot of projects with different, uh, different clients, different even objectives, different goals, no, different teams within the, the consultancy firm, no, and you have to manage them. Uh, it, there are some weeks uh, that one takes a lot of attention and the other ones you cannot give the, enough time to them, but you have to solve these things that, that the client know that you are thinking on of them, no, and and how to manage this variety of is like uh, a little bit no acrobatic, you know. <laughs> the, yeah. And then it's yeah. a thing that you you keep learning yeah, yeah, during the the career. Yeah, totally. And I think that uh, it's very different from the lab because normally you have this long term anxiety of is I the project is going to I hope they have the results that I need I'm going to publish I'll have a grant it's more long term and maybe here it's more short term because you have like eight projects at the same time and you have to keep everything more or less organized and in your head and that's something you surely have to learn on the on, on working on it on the practice mm. perfect thank you the discussion would be what is it that you enjoy the most in your job right now Mm, I have an answer for that, and for me, the uh, working together with a cross-disciplinary team. Um, as I explained in my presentation, uh, we have a lot of um, discussions regarding uh, the ethical implications of artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. And I then have those discussions with uh, my PhD supervisor, because when you are working in the university, you just uh, write papers. And, uh, and I also have to add to this that either in universities you could work with uh, people from other areas like social scientists or wh whatever, but they really don't encourage you to do so. So I would say that working with a cross disciplinary team. Yes. Yeah, I, I would agree with Anna and I would add because in our company we have a lot of, uh, how do you call it? Uh, not problematic but uh, people that have really radical opinions often and that's also very interesting sometimes it's frustrating but it's very interesting to you say the obvious and someone else will say the exact opposite and this is a really nice exercise <laughs> now for me the the thing that i like most of my career is that i i keep learning continually i mean uh, every project is a challenge and uh, I do projects in fields that I really don't know. So, as I told, in my case, I don't. Uh, I have some expertise because uh, out of uh, ten years, I have some expertise in in several areas. That I so my kind of consultancy is more methodologic. So I I I, I apply methodology, you know, how to structure a strategic reflection process or something like that. So. Uh, sometimes I start projects in fields that I don't know anything. No? For example, three years ago, I didn't know anything about tourism. And now I've worked in several strategic uh, uh, touristic plans and whatever. We have the same with museums and the same with, with different sectors. That uh, once you have a project in this sector, you have, first of all, to, to get involved with the sector and to know a little bit, to read a lot, to, to gather different inputs and try to become a little expert in this sector so it's really this is really fascinating or really challenging no and this is maybe i would uh, i would say like that since we don't have well we have a multidisciplinary team but not uh, this kind of maybe different discussion since we in, in, in all the project we are one two people involved no not more no because of the size of the company uh yeah learning no continually learning and and changing of things no so i can be working two hours uh in one project and two hours in another project and and in one day i, I have gone through different things completely different one to the other no and that's well that keeps you alive you know <laughs> not boring i mean no i mean yeah. it's, it's nice 
Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Although I have to say sometimes it's also a bit daunting. <laughs> so I don't know anything about uh, aging and research and I have to, but it's true that when you come home, you have learned so much that uh, the, the value for your own life, it's, it's really nice to be continuously learning. And it's something that probably that if we didn't have it, we would lack. So I say it's daunting, but if I kept to the same task or the same um, area, maybe I would be bored for sure. So yeah, completely agree with John. Great, the next question would be, uh, for somebody who's uh, performing their research now, what would be some specific actions they could take to get these skills and, and become a, a good consultant? I, I think you have to do, do it, <laughs> you have to take the jump. I don't know if there's too many, I mean, you can improve some type of oral skills if you think, I mean, if you think they are lacking something that's very specific, or uh, time management, or you can have these abstract uh, courses on these topics, but until you are really working on it, I don't know if you really, you know, you can yeah. study the topics as an abstract term, but that's my opinion, I don't know. Mm, yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Like you have to work um, on this kind of, 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 of jobs to really um, learn those skills. Like you cannot learn it previously because it's hard to know what are your um, drawbacks. Yes, yeah, there's nothing to, to add, so I agree. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, on postdoc. Is there, uh, what is the value in, in doing a postdoc if you want to transition into consultancy? So I did two and it's background information. So it's uh, working in a hospital, it's not the same as working in an institute, uh, you know more people, you touch different things. It's not the postdoc per se, it's the experience that you have. Now, if you tell me I'm going to do a postdoc in exactly the same institute with the same topic, I don't see the point. If you change the areas, if you change cities, if you change like type of institution, it's not negative. Of course, then you have to think, how far, uh, how, how many postdocs will I extend? Because there's also a timeline you know, of years of life, of career that you want to, to have. So I left it at 35, I don't remember. So I think it's a good point. It could be, could be earlier, of course, but uh, you'll have to think it could not be much later. You cannot start a completely new career at 50. So maybe take that into account. If you want to do a postdoc and have another experience, it, I think it's good, mm -hmm. but don't, don't do it until you're 50 and then try to shift because then, as John said, if you have to start a little bit on the bottom, you have like a, a progression that you would like to do. So I don't know, that's, that's my opinion. Yeah, no, for me, it's uh, unquestionable that uh, postdoc uh, give you a lot of things no? and you learn a lot of things. But maybe if you know that, uh, or if you think of working as a consultant, so after the PhD, maybe it's enough to, to make the, the jump, if, if you have it clear, eh? uh, exactly. because the things that maybe in, in my opinion, eh, the, the things that the postdoc can, can bring you is that more environmental uh, relationship with people, um, maybe a little bit more of, of uh, how to focus on problems, something like that. But, but postdoc for me is basically to go deep on a, on a, con on a specific topic, no? So if, if the thing you're gonna work uh, is related with this topic, so perfect, because you, you will be, uh, you will have more knowledge of that. If it's not related, I'm not sure if it will add a lot, a lot, a lot of, of things, or uh, maybe these things you will learn anyway if you jump to the consultancy and you stay two years working as a consultant, no? Yeah, yeah. I, I have to, to say that sometimes it's uh, kind of, or under my experience, it's kind of hard to decide which career uh, you want to focus on. Like, because sometimes, like for example, I miss to give uh, classes at the university. Um, so yeah, it, it's hard to decide uh, when to work as a postdoc, when to go back to the private sector. It's it's kind of hard to decide when, but um, yeah. And also I have to say that as a data scientist, it's kind of 
easy to jump from one side to the other because we have a lot of um, jobs positions open. But yeah, but also I have, <laughs> under my experience in the postdoc career, I have like a lot of um, negative um, experiences because I I applied to uh, a lot of uh, positions and I got a lot a lot of rejections and that was um, damaging my self esteem. And talking with uh, other colleges that uh, other other uh, friends that are also um, looking for postdocs, they have the same experience. So uh, be aware that if you are looking for a postdoc, it's gonna be hard, or at least it's my experience. It was hard, really hard to find. Yes. Uh, just to add uh, that you you miss the thing of teaching, no, in, at university. Actually, it's it's not the thing that I have done. When I I did teaching when I was doing the PhD. Yeah, but but even in the consultancy, if you are if you get some expertise in a very specific topic, you can also I know some consultants that that teach at universities or at business school specific mm -hmm. topics as associated teachers. I mean, uh, it's not like academic, uh, academic topics, but uh, at, at least here in Spain, I don't know how it works uh, abroad, but there is this figure of associated teacher that, that it was uh, initially uh, thought for people uh, giving this kind of transfer of knowledge from the private sector to, so, so this practical knowledge, let's say, to the, with the private sector background to the to the students no so this uh well it's it's a thing that of course if you're a consultant a consultant but uh i know some few of them that have some hours uh to perform some some teaching at even university or or private schools like business schools mm -hmm. yeah that's true mm -hmm. yeah i have Not to say we have, we have we have that situation also. We work with a business school in Italy because one of the my of the, of the bosses is from Italy and uh, is always inviting us to give a, a normal. I don't want because it's a business school, but uh, he's always motivating us to do some some classes on some specific topics. And so yeah, so so it could be still a, a, an opportunity to to give classes, or you do a lot of uh, presentations to audiences, which is not a class, but you do also have often this engagement with the yeah not teacher student but public yeah. <laughs> audience yeah but i yeah but they miss that right like i miss engagement with the students so but mm. anyway well thank you so much we have uh, run out of time for this webinar we we reached the end but again if there are any questions that haven't been answered uh please uh, contact us uh, at this and we'll do our best to to put you in contact with the speakers so thank you, Sonia, Joanne, and Anna for your time and your collaboration in this uh, this career webinar. We really hope you enjoyed participating. It was a, a pleasure listening to you. Sure. We will thank soon you. be sharing the, the recording of this session through the BIS social media channels. And in the meantime, please stay tuned for our next career webinar. On behalf of BIS, we wish you a wonderful evening. We hope that you and your loved ones are still safe and healthy. And until next time, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much.